Welcome to Justice Matters. I'm San Francisco Public Defender Jeff Adachi. Does San Francisco need a new jail? The city, including its criminal justice leaders, is divided. Well, a lot of people don't think a replacement jail is necessary because of the number of people incarcerated in the county. And what they're doing is pushing for alternative solutions. Today, about uh, 50 people gathered for a town hall meeting in San Francisco and an update on what's happening with the repl proposed replacement facility at the old Hall of Justice building, which is said to be not only seismically unsound, but outdated and in pretty rough shape. Critical Resistance Oakland also released a report that organizers say describes, describes the harms and wastefulness of the project, that there's a declining jail population, and frankly, they say the funds would be better spent elsewhere. Instead of building a, a new jail, why don't we use just a fraction of that money to go to mental health programming and services that you know where we can actually reduce the jail population by diverting people inside um, as well as having you know pre-arrest programs now supporters have said it's very important to keep a good facility here in san francisco that the jail population is complex they have to serve those with psychiatric needs to those with gang affiliations now we have reached out to the sheriff's department for comment meantime organizers say they're mobilizing for a hearing coming up sometime next month with us today on justice matters our chief deputy sheriff matthew freeman consultant jessica flintoff with the san francisco taxpayers for public safety, and Brandon Martin with the Public Policy Institute of California. Now, let me start with you, Chief. In San Francisco, we've seen the jail population decrease from a high of 2,400 to about half that. I think I checked this morning, it was about 1,200. Why do we need a new jail in San Francisco? Well, uh, good question, and there's uh, no doubt that we have in recent years seen a reduction in the average daily population of the San Francisco County Jail. Although uh, we certainly have seen what we believe to be uh, some stabilization in the average daily population, hovering around 1,300 inmates uh, on a daily basis. Uh, but it's interesting, when you consider what the Sheriff's Department is proposing in terms of what we're calling the Rehabilitation and Detention Facility, which is a facility designed to replace the aged and seismically deficient jails on the Hall of Justice, County Jail number three on the sixth floor, County Jail number four on the seventh floor, we're actually talking about a significant reduction in overall beds in the San Francisco County Jail. So we're talking about reducing uh, the capacity of the county jail. Uh, and this is in response to some of the great successes of the entire criminal justice system in San Francisco. We're realizing some of the fruits of our labor when you think in terms of alternatives to incarceration, pretrial release mechanisms, as well as the robust and healthy uh, in custody offender programming that the sheriff's department uh, offers, which aids in the reduction of recidivism as people are released back into the community. But just to give you some uh, numbers, uh, county jail number three and four uh, in the Hall of Justice, uh, when combined, is a total of 828 rated jail beds. And what we propose to build in the RDF, Rehabilitation and Detention Facility, is 384 beds. So, so this it would is this is be smaller, much smaller. Than this the is current that facility. is correct. And when you look at system wide, if you were to uh, take all of the jail beds that are currently available in the San Francisco County Jail, although I would uh, just offer that uh, two of our jail facilities are closed uh, in the sheriff's department's mind, never to be reopened, uh, but that would total 2,360 beds. And if we were to fast forward to the year 2021 and the RDF were to be built, we're talking about a total available bed count of 1,544 beds. So once again, a I mean, significant reduction in total jail beds uh, for the San Francisco uh, County Jail System. But nonetheless, jail beds that are and will be needed for public safety. Okay. Now, from what the chief says, mm -hmm. they're gonna be building a smaller jail. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's, I think, recognizes that there are fewer people mm -hmm. in jail. But for the people who are in jail, mm -hmm. the 1,200 people, mm -hmm. 
We know that the current jail is seismically unsound, mm -hmm. that if there's an earthquake, and they're saying that mm -hmm. there's a 60% chance mm -hmm. of an earthquake here in San Francisco in the next 20 years, uh, people can be seriously hurt and even killed. Uh, why doesn't that justify building a new jail? Well, Jeff, I think on the 10th anniversary of Katrina, it's a really important question that San Francisco needs to be asking itself in terms of the safety of people inside of our jails. That said, I think we all agree that the Hall of Justice jails need to be closed as soon as possible. I think that we need to explore if we can do that without building another jail. We have a lot of questions about the current jail building proposal. And I think something San Francisco's might not realize is that we have built three jails in the last 30 years. They may not realize that because the question has not come before voters in 25 years. The city knows that building new jails is not popular with voters. So they finance them through a more expensive means, not like a general obligation bond as they'll see this fall to promote more affordable housing, but through certificates of participation, which require a higher interest rate. So this $240 million proposed new facility. That's the cost that's estimated? That's the local debt the city has estimated that they will ask the board to take out this fall, is expected to cost a total of $600 million over the next 30 years. That's construction so the whole, alone. The whole price tag is going to be something $600 million. For construction alone. Yeah. The Sheriff's Association of California estimates that the cost of construction equals only 10 percent of the total cost of its facility over its lifespan. So I think we are required to ask, is mm -hmm. this the most effective, most cost-effective intervention we can make to remove people from the Hall of Justice? What about the argument that it's a smaller jail, that it's a third of the capacity mm -hmm. of, of the current jail? Does, does that ring true? Mm -hmm. And does that justify the cost? The controller of San Francisco has been doing a lot of studies, a lot of projections, and every year that projection is updated, it's gone down. And that hasn't considered a lot of the policy changes that are on the table. The new bail unit that your office is implementing, the new young adult court that the district attorney's office is promoting. And they forecast that we'll need upwards of 1,600 beds in the year 2020. Depending on which jail facilities are brought online, uh, Chief Freeman mentioned a couple facilities that the Sheriff's Department presumes won't be brought back online. But I think that's something that needs to be looked at. I think we need to look at classification, look at how we use existing facilities for those who unfortunately do need to be detained in the interest of public safety. Now, Brennan, the biggest change that we've seen in terms of criminal justice policy has been realignment. Mm -hmm. And this is an uh, initiative that came uh, out of the state where uh, people who are being housed in state prison for low-level offenses and were supervised uh, by state parole are now being uh, held in, in local facilities. Uh, we've seen uh, huge explosions in jail populations in Los Angeles and, and other large urban counties. Yet in San Francisco, uh, as we heard, we've seen a reduction. What has been the impact of realignment uh, on uh, jail populations in San Francisco and other places? And uh, does that either justify building more jails, which is what some counties have done, is they start building mm -hmm. more jails yeah. because the argument is that they have more people uh, who need to be in local custody. Yeah, so um, there's two main pressures that we've looked at uh, in terms of realignment on uh, county jail populations. The first being, of course, like you mentioned, that there's a new class of felonies now that are sentenced to county jail instead of state prison, which they did before realignment. The other interesting pressure is uh, individuals coming out of state prison, either on parole or uh, post-release community supervision locally. Any violation they have almost will be served in county jail. And so what we've seen is since September 2011, the month before realignment went into effect until September 2014, statewide the jail population is up nearly 15 percent. Now San Francisco is unique in the sense that the jail population is actually down since realignment. And so I did, uh, I looked at some of the other Bay Area counties and the only other county that saw a decrease with San Francisco is Alameda. So San Mateo, uh, Santa Clara, and Contra Costa both have had, all three have had large increases in their jail population between 8 and 15 percent and Marin County has stayed basically the same. Um, there are a number of counties across the state uh, building facilities. Um, 
before this most recent $500 million, the state previously has already given out $1.7 billion for new jail construction across the counties. Where is this money coming from? Uh, it comes from lease revenue bonds. So uh, the first program, which was about $1.2 billion, was passed in 2007, so before the recession, and there's been some issues with that um, under AB 900. And then uh, after realignment passed, they did another $500 million in 2012, uh, SB 1022, and those funds were given out last year. And SB 863 will be given out later this year, which is the last $500 million. I don't expect any more uh, funding in the next you know, five to eight years because that is $2.2 billion the state's given. And so we're expecting between 35 to 40 counties to apply for this last $500 million. Now I understand San Francisco has applied or is correct. in the process of applying. And one argument that I've heard uh, the advocates against the jail make is that this money could be better spent on programs to rehabilitate uh, people, uh, housing, uh, you know, other uh, measures. And I just saw that uh, presidential candidate uh, Bernie Sanders says, uh, said today that it costs more uh, to send uh, someone to uh, jail than it is uh, to send them to Harvard. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's expensive. It costs a lot of money. What, what's your response to that? Uh, do, do you think that uh, programs and, you know, other non-custody type of alternatives uh, could be the answer? Well, I, I think it's uh, important to p point out that these aren't either or scenarios and that the city and county of San Francisco is a very dynamic city. It's a very di diverse city. Uh, it's a city that uh, takes a leadership role on many uh, issues from criminal justice to social issues. But it's also a city that does have its fair share of challenges. Affordable housing, uh, key, key among them. Uh, education. Uh, but these uh, social issues are not either or uh, proposals. Now from the Sheriff's Department perspective, Obviously, we're very concerned about public safety and the role that we play in public safety. One of the things that's interesting, we talk about the uh, realignment, AB 109, uh, which took effect in October 2011, is it, it did many things, but one of the things that it aimed to do was to uh, return to the county level local control of the management of offenders. And what some of the counties are experiencing is the fact that they never had in place the robust systems, uh, alternatives to incarceration, pretrial diversion, the sheriff's department, and then by extension, the city and county of San Francisco was doing AB 109 years before the state enacted this law. When you think in terms of our, uh, our, our own recognizance release, our supervised pretrial release, court appointed homeless services, um, I mean, these are uh, uh, initiatives that lead the way that stand second to none I think we're an example to the other 57 counties in the state of California of how to manage offenders in a way that doesn't rely solely on incarceration. Uh, we understand that incarceration is not a one size fits all to public safety, but working with the controller's office on inmate population studies, working with our criminal justice partners to include the public defender's office, district attorney's office, and certainly adult probation, uh, we are very confident in the need uh, to build a smarter jail and a smaller jail uh, in order to preserve public safety. I, I know one issue that has come up is electronic monitoring. I think most people are, are familiar with, uh, you know, you wear a, a band on your leg and they're able to monitor movements. And I've heard that that is underutilized uh, in San Francisco, that, uh, you know, we don't use it as, as much as we should or, or, or we could. Is that something that could help fill the gap if there wasn't a new jail constructed? I think the question to the extent that electronic monitoring uses is better for Chief Freeman, but I think in considering how it should be used is that it's got to be paired with services, treatment, housing, the things that would really address the needs that are driving people to commit crime in the first place. So I think it's a question of how it's used and also uh, when it's used, if it's used in a pre-trial setting or a post-release setting. Um, and there's so many different purposes to it. I don't think that San Francisco ever has or would go down the road that some other jurisdictions have, which is just using electronic monitoring as a one-for-one -one replacement for jail um, to relieve overcrowding. 
Uh, so I think it has a place, but I don't think it's um, the solution for this problem. Do, do we know how many people we have on uh, electronic monitoring today? Uh, I don't know how many we have on electron, electronic monitoring uh, today. What I can tell you is, is that uh, Sheriff Mercurimi and the Sheriff's Department uh, are committed to the uh, proper and effective use of electronic monitoring. We have an entire division in our department, Community Programs Division, uh, which does an assessment of uh, all of the inmates that are in, incarcerated in the county jail to determine their eligibility for the host of programs that we offer to include electronic monitoring. Uh, and we work uh, closely with the courts, with probation, uh, to, to make those determinations. And I agree with Jessica, uh, what's also important in what we do is a holistic approach. So we're not interested in putting someone uh, on an electro electronic monitoring mm -hmm. bracelet simply as a substitute uh, for them to be in the jail. We pair with it services that address their underlying uh, criminogenic needs. Uh, I think one without the other, it, it, it certainly just doesn't have the effectiveness mm -hmm. that you want it to have. Yeah. Now, Brandon, the Public Policy Institute has studied the impact uh, that bail has on jail mm -hmm. populations. and. Uh, most of the people who are in jail, and this is true in San Francisco, are there simply because they don't have the money uh, to post uh, a certain sum for their release. And it's, uh, somebody could have uh, a bail of $1,000 on, on a minor offense, and if they can't afford it, they're gonna be in. Yet somebody who has money and can afford to post bail on a serious crime is, is gonna be out on the streets. What impact do you think that bail reform uh, could have? And, you know, New Jersey, uh, Maryland uh, have changed their laws so they're not reliant on money bail. And instead, they're looking at uh, common sense factors like whether a person has a history of not showing up to court, or whether a person can be safely released to their family, whether they present a, a public safety risk. Your thoughts? Uh, yeah. So I, I don't know. Um a ton about bail, but I do know that bail varies by county. And so in, in several San Francisco, or several California counties, bail is quite high. Um, but I also do know that in pretrial programs in a lot of counties, they look beyond just bail. And they do take into account the offender's history, um, their job prospects, are they living with someone, and they put them on pretrial uh, electronic monitoring. So that could be one way um, to go without reforming bail, but to, to go beyond sort of the bail system and look at other pretrial programs. I mean, in San Francisco, if we had a program, I've heard of a program like this in, in, in the Bronx where uh, there's a nonprofit that actually posts bail uh, for people, and they have something like a 98% a mm. uh, rate of people coming back to court. I mean, that could make a huge difference in terms of reducing uh, the, the, the jail population, yet we haven't looked at that. Uh, in, in California. You know, one thing I, I wanted to talk about is the fact that the uh, population of the jail, if you look at it now, uh, overwhelmingly are people of color, right? Six percent of our population in San Francisco are African Americans, yet 56 percent of the people in jail, that's one of the numbers I saw, uh, are African Americans. Uh, isn't that of concern? And when we're building a new jail, don't we expect that uh, we're going to see similar numbers in terms of disproportionate impact? And you know, one thing that's been been pointed out is that there is uh, over policing in many of these communities that results in more African Americans, for example, being arrested for drug offenses, even though all the national statistics show that African Americans don't use drugs or abuse drugs at any higher risk than, say, whites or any other group. Uh, any thoughts on that, Chief? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it, it's a it's a issue of great importance. It's it's a issue that definitely deserves uh, the requisite attention, and I think the city and county of San Francisco uh, is doing their due diligence in examining this area. Uh, I know that uh, the the county has hired uh, exterior consultants to come in and take a look at the criminal justice system in San Francisco and to examine this very issue. And uh, through reports released by these studies, we'll uh, apply lessons learned and see what's being done. I think the key thing though, and it kind of brings us back to some of our previous discussion is, we're talking about a reduction in uh, uh, the county jail. So there won't be any uh, increase in incarceration of, of these communities because there won't be the beds there 
uh, to do that. Um, what I can tell you is in the fiscal year of July 1, 2014, ending June uh, 30th, 2015, 40% uh, of the bookings received into the San Francisco County Jail were Afro-American, 15% uh, Hispanic. So that does bring you to 55% uh, black and brown people uh, being booked into the county jail. Uh, the Sheriff's Department is certainly committed to working with the criminal justice partners to examine that and to see what positive effect can be brought to bear on that. But it's also important to point out that in, in large part, we do not control those that are brought to us to the county jail. Uh, arresting agencies certainly play a large part in that. And then the courts. Uh, people are committed to the custody of the sheriff's office by the court. That doesn't mean that we say hands off, we don't play a role in that, we certainly do. One of the ways that we can have positive effect on this is through our very robust alternatives to incarceration and pretrial diversion uh, mechanisms. Okay. What, what are your thoughts, Jessica? Did you think that there's a responsibility when you build a jail to look at who's in it and why people are in it? And yeah. you know, I think it's no secret. I mean, as a public defender, I, I've seen it's, it's poor people and people of color. Mm -hmm. And you can point to a lot of reasons, economic mm -hmm. reasons, um, you know, family support, all kinds of things. But in the end, do we have a just system if we're building a jail and we're filling it with black and brown people who are disproportionately being uh, charged you know, with, mm -hmm. with certain crimes? Mm -hmm. You know, I think we are obligated to look at this question now when we're considering building a jail and we have the opportunity to do something different and we could look at alternatives and what impact they would have on communities of color. With nearly 60% of people in jail, African American or people of color, we have a problem here in San Francisco that's across the nation. I think in the midst of this movement for black lives that we are seeing, you know, communities are really being asked, how can we ensure real community safety? How can we increase the amount of justice in each of our criminal justice systems? And so it's a question that goes beyond the sheriff's department. Um, it's a question that's really citywide. How should we be spending our resources and could we be spending them differently to reduce some of the disparate impact? Um, a lot of times in this debate we hear a lot about um, the seriously mentally ill people in jail, which are about 12 to 14 percent, I believe the public health department reported as a serious mental illness. A higher number have other mental health issues. And those individuals sit in jail for an average of 144 days, simply because they're awaiting placement in treatment in the community that we simply don't have. So I believe we should be investing there. And when we talk about the seriously mentally ill population, most of them are African American. When we talk about the concerns of parents in jail, nearly 59% in a recent study that the Sheriff Commission showed that 59% of people in jail were parents. Half of those parents were African American. So when we're looking at the intergenerational cycle of incarceration, trying to break that, looking at the issue of solving mental illness, we're asking about questions about racial inequities. Now, Brandon, I'm gonna ask you about Prop 47. Mm -hmm. This was a statewide proposition which reduced crimes that had been treated as felonies for decades, I mean, like possession of drugs and yes. petty theft with the prior, and made them misdemeanors. Now, a person still can be prosecuted and in prison for those crimes, but they can no longer go uh, to state prison, and it's going to be treated as a misdemeanor. Do we know what the impact has been on Proposition uh, on the jail population because of Proposition 47? So, so unfortunately, we don't have statewide data to look at that, um, recent data after Prop 47. Um, but you can think through how it will work, and most likely now with these nonviolent, non-serious uh, drug and property felonies becoming misdemeanors, now when you're out in the field and you're arresting someone and you're arresting them for a misdemeanor, a lot of counties have site and release policies or you don't even take them to the county jail because you know it's so impacted. And so from that aspect, it should decrease the population in county jails. Now we don't know what that impact is. Um, I'm sure there will be adjustments by the sheriff. Um, you know, when there's overcrowding, you of course are sort of early releasing misdemeanors or you're citing releasing them in the field. But now if you have space in your jail, because of Prop 47, maybe you start holding on to some misdemeanors that have criminal history and things like that. And so we still haven't seen sort of the overall effect. I'm sure when the data comes out, you'll see a 
sort of big dip in the first few months, but there might be sort of a, a leveling off and a, a com coming back up of the population as sheriffs sort of tailor their policies. Now, we don't know what the jail population is going to be in five years mm -hmm. or, or ten years. Is there a way that we can accurately predict this? You know, we, we, you know, we uh, still don't know what, what kind of laws might affect uh, either more or less people uh, in jail. One of the things that has been cited is that San Francisco is going to be hiring 300 more police officers and presumably that's going to result in, in more arrests. Um, what can we say about where we're going to be 10 years or 20 years from now and, and how do we build or not build a jail based on that? Yeah, so looking 10, 20, 30 years down the road is hard because you don't know if there will be changes to state law. You don't know what the next administration at the county level will be doing. Uh, in our research, what we do is we just take the current jail population and times that by the estimated population growth of the county. Um, that's very sort of rudimentary. Um, if you have consultants, which San Francisco has done uh, a few times um, through the controller's office and outside consultants, they can take a closer look at your inflow and outflows of jail the type of offenses and try to give you a better estimate, but looking 10 to 20 years down the road is hard. And that's something that people need to remember is even if you move fast on constructing a jail, it's not going to be open for four years between construction and financing. And so you have to look down the road. Now, I'll give you the last word, Chief. Do you agree or disagree with what Brandon said? Well, uh, um, I don't take any, any uh, issue with anything that he said. I think uh, we're all in this criminal justice system waiting to see what the real effects of Proposition 47 are. I can tell you that anecdotally when I have conversations with district station police captains uh, I hear that property crimes uh, are on significant upswing in the city and county of San Francisco and some of this is tied directly to the attitudes of the type of individuals, offenders that commit those crimes and their realization of Proposition 47 and the reduction in penalties. So as those numbers become reality and the statistics are released, we'll have to see how the criminal justice system chooses to respond to that. But I also wanted to comment on uh, something Jessica was saying, and we think in terms of underserved uh, communities, populations within the county, uh, uh, people of uh, uh, black and brown, uh, you know, one of the things that we see in terms of the reduction of recidivism is our ability to offer uh, quality services to this population. When you think in terms of replacing the two jails in the Hall of Justice, one of the reasons we want to do that is more than just bed count. It's also about the infrastructure to provide those services. And I'll tell you briefly, in the San Francisco County Jail System, we have an embedded charter high school, five key school. You know, and this is incredibly beneficial uh, to these uh, individuals because they can get their high school diploma while they're in our custody. We also have vocational training programs in the Sheriff's Department from aquaponics to truck driving school to serve safe certificates. We're going to be rolling out an initiative with one of the local uh, trade unions soon. So we're talking about jobs. We're talking about someone's ability to get a job when they get out of, out of custody. And then we offer the full host of programs in terms of substance abuse, anger management, and our NOVA program, which is one of our post-release programs, wraparound case management services, also includes housing. So these are very real things uh, that maybe is a little bit um, unusual for a sheriff's department uh, to engage in, uh, but, we, but we don't shy away. We'll step up. We'll be a leader. Others will follow because they'll see what we're doing is right. But even after having done all of that, there will be some number of offenders in this county which will not be eligible for these alternatives to incarceration. And I think we have an absolute obligation to have a jail that is safe, both for the inmates and for the uh, employees that work in these jails, and that uh, incarcerate people in a way that sets them up for success post-release. And that's what the RDF will do. Okay, thank you. San Francisco may be in the enviable position of having a dwindling jail population. But new jail construction requires looking into the future, and none of us has a crystal ball. Pending an environmental impact report, new jail construction is expected to begin in 2017 and be completed by 2019. I want to thank our guests, Chief Deputy Sheriff Matt Freeman, Jessica Flintoff, and Brandon Martin. See you next time 
on Justice Matters.